right uh, right group to to explain that to you. You're in the right place at the right time. <laughs> And I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that are discussed today. Um, not that you've taken a lot of L's. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like that. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things today that will that'll definitely be uh, you know, applicable to what you, you've gone through over the last year. Um, so we're, we're excited for this. It's going to be fun. Um, there's definitely been a lot of L taking uh, that you know just doesn't get it talked about enough. Um, but it definitely is an aspect of, you know, buying NFTs and trying to flip them. And, um, you know, we're going to get into it. Yeah, yeah dude, yeah. I want to learn how to take strategic L's, too. That That is a thing. That is certainly a thing. Um, you know, definitely want to avoid that as much as possible. But if there are situations, um, it definitely can be beneficial to, you know, say, all right, time to, time to take the L. Um, and how you can use that to your advantage. Um, Jacob, are you walking back to the office right now? Yeah, I'm just getting to the office now. I, uh, I'm i shooting Keyboard Monkey a message. Not sure who all is going to end up joining, but uh, I'm curious to see, uh, Alex, what would you do if you were advising uh, to Yeah Yeah on that $8 million sale yesterday, a little $7 million casual game? Um, you know, good luck writing off other things, right? I mean, there's a couple of different ways to go about it. The big question is, is a straight sale the best way to go about it? I think is the first thing. Um, Because you can structure a sale in a couple of different ways for it to be more tax advantageous. Um, But if you've already gone and sold your... NFT, you've minted your profit, um, getting $7 million in losses. Apologize for the background, I'm in New York City. Uh, but getting $7 million in losses is not really something you want to do uh, because, hey, that's $7 million going out the door. But if it's something you've purchased and you thought it was going to be a winner, and unfortunately it's not, then you might as well sell it and redeploy that capital to something else. Totally agree. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that's like one of those situations Again, where yeah. like to, to find a loss, right. It's, it, you're almost like, you know, there's no reason you should be going and looking for a loss um, like on purpose, unless there is like a strategic way to, to take one where, you know, it just didn't play out the way you thought it was and it doesn't make sense and there's a better place to put money. Um, yeah, I so... think, you know, what, what I think makes sense here, Hunter, what, what I would kind of hope for for everybody as we're, as we're trickling in and we might can reiterate it in a little while, but uh, thankfully Herb is, is helping out from the O'Shiny show and uh, an ape in his own right. Herb's going to help out with our recording, so we should get, have an MP4 after this that we can share. Um would love for, you know, uh, Andrew, Alex, and Charles to talk a little bit about, you know, what do we mean when we're saying, you know, tax harvesting, tax lost harvesting, taking L's, right? Like, these are all funny words. And I, I tagged Keyboard Monkey, and I've chatted with him a little bit. You know, I'm not sure if he'll end up joining us or not. But if you look over the last month, Keyboard Monkey's taken a couple of really large L's publicly, you know, uh, like a hundred ETH loss on an asset kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, he, he's a day trader who may end up with millions, you know, likely millions in gains. So at some point, you know, millions in losses could be a good offset. So uh, I'd love these guys to give a little bit of the, you know, kind of what is it? What does it mean? Why is it important to do before end of year? Um, and then I think what we do is have been, you know, Ben Jam and NFTs Anonymous, Hunter, you know, you three are up here. You can share, uh, feel free to share some big L's of your year. You know, NFTs Anonymous did a, a punk giveaway that he's kind of harvesting an L through, I think. So there's there's a few different things going on. Um, but yeah, we'd love to do that. And, and before we hop into it, just say, you know, we've got Zen Ledger Ann up here from Zen Ledger as well, because, you know, the, this group, we put together the NFT tax guide, um, it is an NFT, you know, upon purchase, it's got 
a DAP that you can ping into and you've got a, a quite a bit of information around crypto, DeFi, NFT tax, taxation. Uh, comes with Zinledger software and uh, a really fun piece of art from the man Sartoshi. So uh, at this point, I think we're calling it a tax mf -er. Um, you know, who doesn't want one of those? So, uh, yeah, if you, uh, Andrew, uh, the way my, my room reads, you want to go to then Alex and Charles, if you guys want to talk a little, I know Alex is walking the streets of New York too. So we might wait until he's settled, uh, just kind of get into it. Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me and, uh, hello to everyone out there. Um, so first to introduce myself, my name is Andrew Gordon. I am also a CPA. Uh, I'm the managing attorney at the Gordon Law Group, a firm of about uh, 15 attorneys, 10 of which mainly focus on uh, cryptocurrency and tax reporting. And so that's my 32nd introduction. Um, but to uh, answer the question, what's all this about tax loss harvesting? Why is it sometimes a good thing to take an L? Well, overall, when you're looking at your portfolio and you have a, a position that's down, that's generally not a good thing. But from a tax standpoint, it can sometimes be used to your advantage. Uh, it's not always a technique or something that you should do in every circumstance. And I'll talk about that a little at the end. Um, but if you're sitting in a position where you have an unrealized loss, and what I mean by that is that you are holding uh, an NFT or cryptocurrency that you bought at a price that was higher than the value today, you have an unrealized loss. Typically, to have a taxable event, you have to realize that loss and sell it or exchange it. And if you do so, once you're in a loss, then you can use that loss to offset other gains in the current year or even carry it forward to future years or up to $3,000 against income in the current year on capital losses. So harvesting losses generally refers to taking um, re uh, unrealized positions, realizing them by selling or exchanging, and then using those losses either now or in the future to offset gains. Awesome, Charles. Yeah, so um, uh, hi everybody, great to be here. Uh, happy to talk about taxes till the cows come home. What, one of the things you have to keep in mind is the type of income that you've got and whether you can use the losses against that type of income. So for example, uh, if you, <coughs> have minted an NFT or you own an NFT and it's appreciated in value and you've sold it. So now you have a capital gain. If you have other NFTs, as Andrew was saying, that have not gained value and they've gone down in value, if you sell off the loss NFT, create a taxable loss, a capital loss that you can offset against the capital gain from the sale of the more valuable NFT. Uh, what you can't do, basically, is use capital losses against ordinary income. So if you took some of the funds from selling your NFT at a gain and you got involved in various DeFi transactions, staking or whatever, and you generated <coughs> ordinary income, the, effect, the equivalent of interest income, uh, then selling the NFT at a loss doesn't do you any good because you can only use $3,000 of a capital loss to offset ordinary income. So before you start harvesting losses, you need to make sure you understand what type of income you've got to make sure that you can use the losses against that particular type of income. So, yeah, so a great when, point. When these guys are saying that, would you uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, there's a difference between um, making gains by being way up on NFTs and making gains, you know, through your day-to-day -day job or your, your personal life, right? So what is the, what's kind of the difference here between, you know, when I mentioned Yeah Yeah, so Yeah Yeah just has a, you know, let's say a $7 million gain on an instant sale of an NFT, that he bought for, you know, he bought it for 100K, sell it for 7 million, you know, that $7 million gain, what would you guys be looking to do as tax advisors, you know, on a hypothetical $7 million gain, I guess, you know, from a write-off perspective, and then, you know, when we're looking at kind of selling and taking losses, like what's, you know, 
tell us where you're doing the deductions from in the explain like I'm five version. Sure. Okay. Thing. I, Here, go ahead, Alec. Go ahead, Alec. I, I can jump in on that one. Uh, so the, the way to look at it is um, I wouldn't go out and buy things at a very high price, wait for the floor to drop on it, and then sell it for a loss. Um, because the big thing to look at that is not just how much are you paying in taxes, but how much cash are you left with at the end of the day? Um, so the only time I would do tax loss harvesting to, to begin with is if you've already purchased something and you're not expecting it to go back up in value, or you're expecting that it's going to take, let's say two to three years for it to go back up in value. But if you sell this, take the proceeds and then buy a different NFT, that that's going to take six months versus three years. Um, so in that case, uh, a loss of, or, or creating that L and harvesting those losses is a productive item or productive use of that NFT and that money. The other b very large thing to remember is that the IRS doesn't look at things at a ETH level. They look at it at, at a dollar level. So if you purchase something, let's say back in January for 100 ETH, when ETH was $150, and you sell it for 50 ETH now, at an ETH level, yes, you're down 50 ETH. But at a dollar level, you're up a lot because 50 ETH, 50 ETH at $4,000 per ETH is going to end up minting you, call it 200 grand. And then when you purchase it, you paid maybe $10,000 for it. Um, so that's the other thing to look at is not just the ETH amount that you're recovering or paying, but also in US dollar terms, what did you pay for it and what did you get back for it? Um, and as a uh, introduction, or my 30 seconds, um, Alex, we're, we're based in New York City. Uh, we service clients across the nation, uh, full service CPA shop, uh, approaching 20 years of experience, um, and my crypto experience goes back to 2018, uh, having worked with or having worked for uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, um, and some of the large accounting and finance firms. Amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, w w one of the things to think about, and, and that was a great segue there, Alex, um, is just because you have a loss doesn't mean you can't buy it back. So you could have a built-in loss in something that you think over the next six months, two years, or whatever time frame will appreciate in value. So there may be some benefits in 2021 to selling your NFT today, waiting 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever you and your account are comfortable with, and then buying it back at a lower price. And, maybe and then that right there holding on to it. Good point is that there isn't a defined, right? There's not a defined period for like that wash trade, right? It's, it's kind of whatever you and your accountant are comfortable <clears> with. And it sounds like at, right now the standard yes. is like 24 to 48 hours, then you can buy it back. As of today. Um, so today... For, for stocks and securities, bonds and so forth, uh, certain assets, there are what they call wash sale rules that if they apply, say you, you, you have to wait 30 days or whatever in order to buy it back to be able to trigger this. Um, today, those rules don't apply to digital assets, NFTs, cryptocurrency, whatever. There is legislation, however, in the Build Back Better or Build Better Back, whatever, uh, draft legislation that may potentially have the wash sale rules apply um, starting next year. So there, there, there may actually be an advantage this year to taking some losses, knowing that you've got the right income to be able to offset it against. Um, the flip side, however, <coughs> is that there's a good chance that at some point in time in the future, capital gains rates will go up. 
they're 20% now plus 3.8 surcharge. So if you think capital gains are going to go up, then it may actually be in your interest to wait and not harvest the losses today, pay tax on your gains today at 20%, and then the capital gains rates go up to 25 or 26% or whatever, use the losses at a much higher rate. So between the wash sale rules potentially coming in, capital gains rates potentially coming in, you really need to work with your accountant and, and your lawyer on what... <coughs> what strategy makes sense in your particular sources. And I, I just want to emphasize that point because I, I, if I have it right, what you're suggesting is in some situations it may be worth not harvesting losses, but actually taking capital gains. And, and I would agree, um, especially give, uh, for instance, the long-term capital gains rates are very likely to increase. Um, it may be better to take it now. And, um, I think that also brings up an, another topic, which is worth mentioning on uh, tax loss harvesting, which is that one of the downsides of selling at a loss now is you reset and buying back. If you buy back, you are resetting your holding period. And so if you originally were in a position where you could get long term capital gains in the future, if the price up, if you've now sold and bought back your uh, date of acquisition is now, for instance, today. And then say in a few months, the price 10 X is or whatever, and then you sell. Well, you've got to wait longer now to actually have the long term capital gains and long term capital gains are taxed, at least under current law, at about half of the tax rate of uh, short term gains. Long term gains are taxed at 0, 15 or on the high end 20%. Whereas short term, it depends on your tax bracket, but the highest amount being 37%. Uh, there's also an additional uh, investment tax that applies, but generally speaking, long term capital gains are much lower, at least under current law. So if you're selling and buying back, it's worth considering that if that price goes up substantially in the future, then you've got to wait longer to have a um, more beneficial tax rate. That, that, that's a great point, Andrew, because not, not only does your holding period restart, but now your basis is whatever you sold it at. So when you buy it back, if you buy it back at what you sold it at, let, let's say you bought, you, you bought it at 100000 you sell it at 10000 Now you buy it back at 10000 Not only does your holding period start, but your basis is now $10,000. If you get down the road and you hold it for more than a year and you sell it, yes, you may get long-term capital gains, but if the capital gains rates have gone up, you've used losses at a 20% rate to generate a gain that is potentially taxable at 25%. So having a loss and, and deciding to use the loss today, you sort of have to read the tea leaves as to what you think is going to happen down the road. Hey, Charles, um, isn't there a, like a 30 day waiting period that you have to until you can buy back in to a similar asset class? That's under the wash sale rules, which as of today, don't apply to digital assets. But yeah, yes, so they're, of, they're, they're, they're looking this. at they're looking at making it happen. Yeah, so that's kind of part of this conversation today, you know, and just kind of when when this crew here mentioned to me the opening, you know, the availability for, for kind of wash sales this year. I mean, you know, without us talking about like a specific huge loss, I, I can say that when I think about a certain project, uh, I'm going to pick on a project that I don't see any PFPs in this room for, or, or assume anyone in here has heavy, heavy bags. That way I don't get anybody mad. But let's take a project that like everybody knows of, like Mechaverse, right? So let's say you bought the top on Mechaverse. You bought eight, eight ETH free reveal Mechaverse and you bought like 10 of them or something, right? Now, at the end of the day, you could still really like Mechaverse, right? Like you could, you could vibe with them and you're sad that their floor is worth like 0.5 ETH, right? But what you could do is you could sell your eight ETH purchase into the current floor at 0.5 
that's a 7.5 ETH, you know, kind of loss. Obviously, there's the USD equivalent that has to come into account, whether that's a 30K loss or whatever. But let's say a simple, you know, you buy it at 8, you sell it into the market at 0.5, and then tomorrow you buy back in at 0.5 or 0.6 for a pretty similar asset because you want the Mechaverse for some reason in hand, but you also want the ability to take this you know, $30,000 loss, basically. You know, I... I can think of other projects that we that we like that we know of that you know I could put in the same category where you bought in because you either believed in it or you liked the team or whatever at two ETH or five ETH or eight and now it's worth 0.5, but you think it's got a path to a bright future or you just want to hold it. Say you're down to ride the ship all the way to zero, but either way, this is the opportunity between now and the end of the year to go in and take that loss. So just take the loss wait 24 hours, buy a similar asset. And, you know, if you play your cards right, you could have uh, you could have a six figures worth of kind of harvesting right there, which might be more than you made at your day job anyways, right? So I think, you know, Ben and, and, and if, if either of you have like a specific question, feel free to throw it out. Um, yeah, dude, then, I do I'd actually. Go oh, for sorry. It. Go for it, yeah. Um, and, and based on that specifically, so... <clears throat> In in that instance, Jacob, let's say you, you were the one who bought that Mechaverse and you wanted to just lower your cost basis. Couldn't you give me a private sale at 0.5 and then I could just sell it right back to you? And wouldn't that kind of lower your cost basis there and not really, you know, affect me negatively anyway besides losing gas fees? Yeah, so I'd love – what I'd love here is I'd love for one of the accountants to answer – but it's like a three prong answer at the same time. Right. So question one, could you just make a new wallet and sell it to yourself? Right. Question two, could you just sell it to a friend and buy it back the next day? And then question three, what if nobody will buy it? Like there's no market at all. Can you just send it to the burn address or, or what? So, uh, I mean, Andrew, if you want to jump on it, that's kind of the three bullet points. I think that, I'm seeing the most common in my uh, in my DMs. Yeah, yeah. as well as and, I'm seeing. Yeah, and I, I get asked that question or some of those questions quite often. Um, and I guess let's start with um, you sell it to a friend for a nominal amount and you have an agreement that he's going to, he or she's going to return it to you in the future. Um, while on its face and even on the blockchain, it may look like you've disposed of the NFT or the cryptocurrency and transferred it to a third party. The IRS or treasury has a number of different regulations that try to stop people from doing all of the bright ideas that they have to decrease tax. And one of those is the wash sale rule. And we've talked about how just because of essentially a loophole that digital assets were not included in the wash sale rule. Um, but um, in, for the most part, the IRS and treasury have closed most other attempts that people make to uh, outsmart the IRS. And I think this is just another one of those examples. And they do so because they have a catch-all rule called the economic substance doctrine. And so for any transaction to actually be considered for tax purposes, it has to have economic substance. And generally what has to occur is um, there has to be a change in value and there has to be a risk to you that um, you've either disposed of something or that the price of uh, what you sold and are going to buy back in the future has actually changed. And so there has to be economic risk. In the case here where you're selling to a friend and you've agreed that and return it back to you, that doesn't have economic substance. In fact, it doesn't even really seem like a sale. It may even be something like a loan. Um, so in the eyes of the IRS, that wouldn't be viewed as a, a bona fide transaction and wouldn't be allowed. Um, Jacob, I'm sorry. What was the, uh, the other subset of that? Yeah, yeah. So there's selling to a friend to buy back the next day. There's selling to yourself in a separate wallet. And then the, the other big category is just what if there's no market for the asset? Whether sure. you bought it for 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, but there's just no buyer. Sure. So selling it to yourself is not a sales transaction. In fact, one of the few types of transactions that are considered non-taxable are self-transfers moving it from one of your own wallets or exchange accounts to another. It's considered a self-transfer. It's not an actual disposition or exchange. And so you can't actually 
really sell itself. Even if you had, for instance, an LLC, that isn't even selling it to yourself. So overall, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but just doesn't work. Um, so can't sell it to yourself, can't sell it to a spouse either. Um, and so, yeah, that doesn't work. Now, if there's no market for it, no liquidity, um, a position can be taken that, for instance, you've burned it or disposed of it for nothing. And there isn't any IRS guidance on this exactly, but many practitioners are comfortable taking the position that if you sent it to a burn address, for instance, or a wallet uh, that is just a known burn address, then you've disposed of it and you've received nothing in return. Um, so that's a like arguable position, but again, no uh, exact on-point guidance from the IRS on that. Charles or Alex, any thoughts? Yeah, what, one of the things to keep in mind in selling to a friend is in the real art world, the, the art world of real physical art, the IRS has an art group that looks at valuations of art. And at some point in time, that art group will turn its focus to the NFT space. So if you sell it to a friend for 0.5 ETH and there's a market on OpenSea or wherever for that same NFT for 2 ETH, the art committee is going to say, wait a second, that wasn't an arm's length sale. They're going to give you all the arguments that Andrew just gave you as to why that wasn't a good sale. They'll disallow and they'll hit you with penalties and interest. So if if there's a market at 0.5 ETH and you sell it to your friend for the same number, that that probably will stand up. But you'll want to be able to show that the market value <coughs> was what you sold it for. You just happened to sell it to a friend as opposed to, to somebody that you don't know. And, and Charles, just, just to uh, piggyback on that, wh what about, for instance, people who are selling bored apes and they mean to sell at 50 ETH and they fat finger it for five ETH and a bot scoops it up real quick and they have no chance of getting it back. There, there's no way that they can claim that as a loss. Well, if, if, if it was a real sale and they can't get it back, then they've got a real loss. Well, hold on, hold on, Charles. I guess just, just to make sure that we're on the same page with the way yep. ben, ben just said that, uh, let's assume in Ben's scenario there that the purchaser actually bought it for 0.08 ETH, right? Like 0.1 ETH, $400. And the current market value is 50 ETH or 250K but they accidentally list it for five ETH and sell it, which is technically a four ETH gain, right? It's still like a $20,000 gain. He's asking if there's a world in which that person could actually claim, right? The $200,000 loss because they uh, sold it well below market value. Like it's right. like an accidental loss. Yeah. Like if, if the people are, are valuing it at that fair market value of 50 ETH, but I mean, there, there's two sides of it, too, because there, there's gains that he's realizing, but it's also the fair market value is way below what he should have been accepting. Yeah, he's the, that person just in a world of hurt. The, 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 the starting point for <laughs> figuring pain. out the only answer is pain. Yes, pain. <laughs> just pain. It's uh, it, the only professional answer. Is yeah, the, the, the IRS will say. The starting point for figuring out what your loss is, is what was your basis? And then it's the difference between the basis and some lower number that it's gone down in value to. So uh, if, if you bought it for an ETH and it's worth right now on the market, you could have sold it for 20 ETH and by mistake you sell it for 2 ETH, then you're going to have a 1 ETH gain even though there's a technical fair market value loss of, of 48 ETH. So you're just, you're, you're, there's no way that you can't deduct more than you paid. So even though it's worth 50, you didn't pay 50 for it. You never recognized 50 in gain. So your basis is only what you paid for it, which is one ETH. Um, and, and to, to go back to, uh, what what Alex was saying earlier, 
Uh, you could actually have a situation where because of the change in value of ETH from a dollar basis, you could actually have a situation where you have a uh, a law, let's think, could you have a situation where you had a loss in ether, but gain in dollars? Uh, and, yes, the, this happens and the answer is yes. On the crypto yeah. market, right? Dan, yeah. I feel like Dan sees that transaction probably a lot on Zen Ledger, right? If people doing that with, with punks or something, I would think. Yeah, we start to see, you know, that that's one question that we get all the time of, you know, is my gain or loss like measured in, in ETH? Um, or in, in USD. And, and you know, I think as a lot of people here on stage had mentioned, like the IRS is really only interested in, in the USD value. And essentially what you need to know is, you know, how much did you pay for your NFT? How much did you sell it for? And put that in USD. And the examples that we typically provide are like three main ones that I think hit home for people is, you know, let's say you're selling your NFT for more ETH, um, but at a higher price. So let's say you bought an NFT for 0.1 ETH when ETH was worth $2,000 and then sold it for two ETH when ETH was worth $3,000. You know, somewhat easy. You paid $200 and you sold it for 6000 And you can say that you made 5800 But you can also sell that same NFT for less ETH, but at a higher USD value for the ETH. So you could buy an NFT at 0.1 ETH when ETH was worth $2,000. ETH is now up to $3,000. And I decide to sell my NFT in 0.8 ETH. So I'm selling it for less ETH, but the dollar value of my ETH is higher. So I paid 200 and I sold it for 240. So my capital gain would be 40. <clears throat> and then the third scenario that we typically run into is selling the NFT for more ETH, but at a lower price. So you can actually have a gain in ETH, but have a, um, a um, essentially a loss on the dollar value. So like as before, I bought the NFT for 0.1 ETH. When ETH was worth 2,000, I sold it for 2 ETH, but the price of ETH dropped to 1,000. So I paid two hundred and sold it for two thousand, and my capital gain would be eighteen hundred. So in like in in different types of scenarios, you can actually sell your NFT for more ETH at a higher price, less ETH but at a higher price, more ETH but at a lower price. Um, people mentioned on stage like the 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 key, you know, in, in all these cases, is just how much you know did you pay for your NFT? How much did you sell it for in USD? The ca the difference would be your capital gain or loss, and you'd pay tax on that. And then, as you know, I think we mentioned as well, what the IRS is, is looking for is dollars. So they're not going to accept your NFT or your crypto for taxes. So what we typically tell our clients is to make sure that they're setting aside um, some crypto uh, or some USD to cover their future taxes um, as they continue to make NFT trades. Yeah, and I think I think one thing that that he mentioned there, you know, just just so everybody who's listening realizes like we are recording this space, <laughs> we will post it, you know, when you're hearing some kind of some Venn diagrams and some walkthroughs and some alpha, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll see pinned at the top, right? The NFT tax guide. That's what a bunch of us worked on. You know, we've all put a lot of kind of time and energy into trying to get this as best understood as we can, but you know, even a simple walkthrough, you know, it kind of requires either pausing or writing it down just to kind of understand where you're at. You know, when I, when I mentioned punks a minute ago, there are like bots that are kind of punk maker, like market makers on the CryptoPunk website. And you can always see kind of buys and sells every day. And it's probably one of the more common collections where you'll actually see someone purchase at 70 ETH, but ETH is at, you know, 3,500. And then they'll sell it for 50 ETH, which is like a huge loss. But ETH ran all the way to 4,800, right? But it's a, it's just, a game. Exactly. So they've decided they would rather stack that ETH, like, like say someone's more bullish on ETH to 10K than they are on punks to 100 ETH, right? That's kind of the, the math that we're seeing there. Oh, Shiny, yeah, welcome to the room yeah. also. Hey, Shiny. What's up, Shiny? Well, yeah. GM, GM. Yeah, I was busy uh, selling all my old NFTs for a loss and then buying them <laughs> there back. There you go. Um, there you right. go. Perfect. I, what, what's right. so, so tell totally me what's this hear. room about? I've been missing it. We're just yeah, talking, we're talking about, about the whole the whole idea of you know you have uh, an NFT you thought run to the moon uh, and it didn't. It did the complete opposite. It did a one eighty on you and it ran down and 
uh, you know, your ability to sell that and capitalize on the loss of, you know, of your entry uh, and, and how that's a beneficial, you know, tax tool uh, to everybody right now. We love the taxes. We do. We do. I love we do love that, the taxes. We definitely to don't. To some we degree, we do. But we don't love the taxes. But uh, you know, I I was just in Puerto Rico for a little bit with some of these people. I see Medved just joined us as well. Like the the tax tax implications. You know, without us getting into a room here about like tax policy, right? Like tax implications are huge. I'm making if you don't realize that you're making a day to day life decision right now by deciding to actually pay your taxes or not, right? Deciding whether you're going to commit fraud on your 1040 or not, right? Are you going to say you had digital assets? Are you going to try to show what you did this year? You know, if you're in the U S right, like it's, these are like big fundamental questions that we're all kind of working through right now, I think. And, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens over the next. I'm always one Jacob. I'm always one that likes to dig into information. You know, we had a great call on the shiny show about taxes and now we're having another one if there's people out there and apologies if it's already been said but they want to learn more about this is there a good medium um post is is there a place a repository of great information somewhere where where should we go if we want to read up about it and uh updates on it as well or is it just is it just following all of you on stage and and focusing on twitter yeah so for now it's you know what we're looking at, we have the NFT tax guide that's pinned at the top that we spent a couple months putting together content wise amongst the group here to the best of our abilities in the current market and the you know the current US standards, basically. Um, I think each of us are, you know, responsive or relatively responsive with our Twitters, you know, with questions. And, and yeah, over time, you know, Charles has, you know, already interfaced with the government a bit, like he probably will do more and, and will loop us in or keep us up to speed. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just I just had a CPA purchase one of the tax guides yesterday and I was really happy because it was their first NFT. You know, the best way we can get people in to help and learn more is to actually just do it right. Buy an NFT, download a wallet, understand crypto questions afterwards. You know, that's kind of kind of where we're all headed right information is key you know when we when we think about um just the common person uh, all around the world how much is collecting a part of their life how how flexible are the assets they buy on a daily basis um it's we're, we're moving into a space for every digital asset they buy access to every single banking tool and it's going to change how consumers behave right and so it's going to actually open up a whole new window for CPAs that want to get into taxes. It's also going to open up uh, a whole lot more work and understanding on the part of the consumer for, um, for taxes and tax education. For- yeah, it's, it's going to become something that's like necessary to know about. And, like, and look, look how many people are in this space right now, right? Like usually taxes are the last thing on everybody's mind. It's something that we don't like. And I, I'm, you know, faulty of this. I, it was not something that I cared about. And I, I look down on people that, are, oh, I got to deal with my taxes. But I think it's going to become a, a very vital part of understanding because, you know, I, I think everything that we do, we've talked about play to earn a lot. All of that is going to now you're going to have to understand how does that Im- impact you on taxes? And the average person is going to become much more tax literate. Um, and they're going to, you know, CPAs are going to be in higher demand and CPAs are going to be uh, necessarily trained in more niche areas because that's just the way uh, I think the financial system is changing right now. Have, yeah, have I'd love had to hear from Med, 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 Oh, sorry. So, sorry and, to cut you off. Time, no, Matt, I'll, I'll let, just wanted to ask if we've had any time to go over at Capital Gains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we now that we're, we're we've been in here for a little while, so we can kind of do a little circuit as well. Uh, and then I'd love... I'd love to hear Ben and, uh, ben and NFTs Anonymous tell us about some L's they've taken this year because that sounds fun. Uh, but Medved, what are you what are you guys thinking with NFT now? Right, like an audience like split between those of us that are here and those of us that are curious. Right, like how do you yeah. see a- education outside of just like art or collecting or music? Right, like this kind of stuff. Totally. Well, look, you know, like uh, I think it's really interesting because. Um, 
one of the great things about NFTs is it's bringing crypto uh, to so many other disciplines into so many creative disciplines. And it's bringing a lot of artists and creative who otherwise, you know, may not have entered the space into the space. But it's also important to recognize that education plays a really key role. And like people in the creative space, um, a lot of the a lot of the artists who may be making life of money have never have never experienced anything like that before. Um, they may not be as uh, as uh, you know literate with the with you know the tax code you know and, and the um, and you know the, the best practices uh, around this. And there's a there's a really really you know there's a big learning curve really just with crypto and with NFTs. And a lot of people are going through it concurrently. Taxes are a whole nother learning curve. Um, and so one thing that we're seeing too, you know, like we kind of, when, when we look at like, uh, the NFT now audience, we think sort of about like the purists and the tourists in the space and like the purists are sort of the people who are day to day in it, who are, who are, you know, buying NFTs, trading NFTs, um, uh, plugged in on Twitter, like active on spaces, all of that. Um, and then the tourists are more the people who are who are still, um, you know, maybe have heard about NFTs, um, are curious about NFTs, like learning how to set up their MetaMask, et cetera. Um, so we're always trying to provide a lot of, you know, like really easily digestible for the latter segment um, to help them kind of like navigate that journey of discovery towards kind of ending up with with all of us here. But, um, you know, it, but it's interesting because the tax side, I think, is an area that many people inside both segments are not super savvy with. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of people who are entering, um, you know, the crypto world through NFTs and um, aren't sure what those best practices are. And I think it's one of those things that a lot of people are, are a little bit hesitant to voice um, because I don't want to seem like they're ignorant or any, of anything, but I think it's a testament to the interest and the curiosity and the need to the interest and the curiosity and the need for done on these, on, on these subjects have been so popular. Yeah, we're starting to see a big demand in that content. Like we just partnered with Bankless last week to put out a comprehensive crypto guide. Um, just did a, a call with FWB last night with our community doing stuff with Rally right now. So starting to see, you know, that that, that education is such a big piece. And I think people are, you know, our goal here is to be able to allow people to continue to ape into whatever they want and, and continue to degen into whatever they want and just have, you know, some guidance and guardrails of what are they doing and, and how can this impact you know, the decision that they're making and then allow them to make you know, decisions that they want to make that, you know, that the best thing that we can do is provide, you know, very clear and concise uh, educational content around, you know, what you should be aware of and, and then allow you to make decisions off of that. Yeah. What, one of the things that, that is, I think, clear from, from all of this is with the swings in values of for ETH and other cryptos and, but having to do gains and losses in U S dollars, it, you can't, there's no intuitive path to say, oh, I've made lots of money or I've lost lots of say. And so, you know, I would encourage everybody, if you haven't already done so, you should be running your wallets through Zen Ledger to figure out what you actually have in a dollar basis in terms of gains and losses so that you don't get surprised next year. Because um, it is counterintuitive. And with the volatility in the crypto space, you until you actually run the numbers, so no. Yeah, one thing one thing I'd love, I mean, like kind of based on Oshani's question a second ago, we could circle back on this. You know, I'm getting a couple of DMs right now from people asking, what if I'm an artist and I'm just selling art, you know, some at a high price, some at a low price. Could you give uh, could one of you guys walk through the two seconds on kind of like personal income versus capital gains in general? And then when we're writing stuff off here or, or you're taking losses aren't against your other capital gains, right? They're against your personal income. So if you could give a little bit of structure around that, that'd be great. Sure thing. I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but happy to go into it again. Um, so if you're an artist, whether you're doing one of ones or you're participating in a 10,000 uh, PFP drop, that income is considered ordinary income because you're getting compensated for your personal work and for the work that you're doing as an artist. If you are buying an NFT for the purposes of future growth um, and increase in value, then that would be considered as capital gains or capital losses. <clears throat> and then the next question with regards to capital gains and losses is, is it considered long-term or short-term for income tax rates? So if it's less than a year in a day, 
it's considered short term. Anything over a year in a day, it's considered long term. Um, what do you? The other question is going to be: What are you able to offset with regards to ordinary income versus capital losses or things of that nature? Um, under normal circumstances, uh, capital losses can offset up to um, your capital gains and then an additional $3,000 against ordinary income. So what that means is, let's say you have $10,000 of capital gains and you have $20,000 of capital losses. That means you're able to offset the entire amount of your $10,000 of capital gains, leaving you with an additional $10,000 worth of losses. And then you're able to take that $3,000 of capital and have it go against your income, leaving you for the next tax year Seven thousand dollars worth of capital losses for you to start with. So and what it doesn't if somebody matter. doesn't have a very much ordinary income as well? I guess just tacking it on at the end, right? So what if somebody doesn't have a W two or yep. they made they made fifty k at their day job this year, but they're up five hundred k in sure. gains that they've taken on. Gains. I see it. NFT is anonymous, and here's putting laughing, laughing, crying face because. I don't even know if this man has a day job. Uh, I, so really, like, <laughs> after, like, I can't wait for us to go down the rabbit hole here in a few minutes. I'm just waiting. Um, so as another disclosure, I use round numbers. It's not examples of any particular individuals. Um, so if it pertains specifically to any other individual, it's purely a coincidence. It's not anybody's situation. Uh, so if, let's say, you have $20,000 of of losses, like I mentioned before, and you have $20,000 worth of ordinary income, <clears throat> you'll still be paying on $17,000 of ordinary income taxes because you can all, only offset $3,000 of that ordinary income. Um, and you'll have a carry forward of capital losses. Uh, and this is something that Charles and Andrew and myself mentioned earlier is that you should run a uh, calculation to see if it's worth you taking a loss um, and harvesting that loss, because if your overall income for 21 in capital gains is very small, and then also you don't have much in ordinary income, then you're most likely in a very low tax bracket. And taking those losses are actually counterintuitive. Um, and it's actually going to be more valuable in 22 when you potentially have a lot more in gains. Um, so that's why you need to know what your income is um, and how much of losses you're able to offset against those incomes. Um, and the character of the income is very important in the sense of, is it capital? Is it ordinary? And with capital gains, you also don't necessarily want to take long-term gains and offset it with short-term losses. The reason behind this is you've held on to the NFTs for over a year and a day, hoping for the value to go up and you've held on to that risk for over a year. So your reward for doing that holding for over a year in that risk is that your tax rate is lower. And now, so instead of paying 24% and then keeping a potential loss into the future with it being short-term losses at a 37% rate, you're offsetting a 20% deduction uh, or income tax. So what you're in essence doing is you're, you're giving up a deduction that's worth $40 and converting it into $24. You're taking um, a lot though, by holding it for so much longer for, for volatile, illiquid assets. Correct. But the long-term gains that you've already harvested, there's no more risk on it because you've already sold that NFT and you now are holding either ETH, stablecoin, or fiat. Um, the other thing to remember is that losses in NFT can be offset against gains in, let's say, stocks and vice versa. So if you have losses, not necessarily in NFTs, but if you have, say, you bought Peloton in January, when I think somewhere in the 140, 150 range per share, it's now down to $50 a share you might want to sell your Peloton and offset those losses against your NFT gains. The thing to remember is that um, Peloton and any other are subject to wash sale rules. So you caught it 
30 days before or 30 days after that sale. So you need to be careful because wash sale rules do apply to stocks and not yet to crypto and NFTs. Um, and once again, I think we've said this a number of times before, this is not tax advice. This is a general conversation that a number of people are having in a room. Philosophical conversations are the way to go. I, uh, I've got a couple of people asking me, asking me questions here. And then uh, NFTs Anonymous, I'd love you to hop in with something. Uh, talk to I want to hear about, some L's, man. Yeah, I want to hear L's, right? Talk oh, about, talk an about interesting the gas job. fees. Talk about the gas fees real quick while trying to take these L's, right? So a lot of people are trying to figure it out. Say they bought an asset for two grand. There's no market. The market's zero. There's get a dollar for it. You know, how, how do they figure out if it's taking the hundred dollar gas fee, right, to go towards that loss, right? Or or is that hundred fifty dollars a tax extra loss to go with the loss itself? So if we could get a little bit around losses there with gas, that'd be great. I I, I can talk to it. My personal view on it is a you need to see what that loss is worth. So if let's say you minted something for 0.08 ETH and it was worth 250 bucks at that, your loss of $200 is worth maybe 75 bucks or whatever it is. So if you're going to put an additional 100 bucks, you save yourself 75 on taxes, you might as well just hold on to that NFT and figure it out at a point in time when maybe ETH doesn't have gas fees anymore. Um, but if let's say you bought something for $10,000 or $100,000 to value in USD and that deduction is worth 2,500 or 25,000 on paying up an extra hundred bucks in gas fees is very well, gas fees is very well worth. So it's all a question of what is your basis in that NFT that you're looking to liquidate? And if that basis is then paying the additional gas fees is worth it. The big thing to remember, we, we're all talking about losses, but the big thing to hear is that a loss is a dollar for dollar reduction in your taxable income or in your capital gains taxes, <clears throat> uh, total income. It's not a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax bill. So if your taxes do are $100,000. Be selling a $10,000 loss on an NFT does not make your tax bill $90,000. It might make your tax bill go down to 70, uh, 70, 97,000 or something along those lines. Um, so you need to make sure that when you're calculating what your benefit is, that you're attributing it to the correct numbers. Right, and this is like, even for like, business expenses and stuff like everybody's like right off you know the whole thing well, that's not always true as well like there's you have to understand that there's that percentage and the breakdown losses is something that you need to understand <clears throat> yeah it, it's a multi-step process first you need to figure out what income you've got then you need to figure out how much is ordinary versus capital then you need to look at what potential losses you might generate you need to look at what the losses could actually be. You need to look at the cost, the gas fees, et cetera, the cost of generating that. And with and without calculations that say, and I don't generate the loss, here's what check I'm going to have to write. And if I do generate the loss, here's the check that I have to write. And then you compare those and see if that delta between those two numbers is a big enough number to make it worthwhile harvesting the losses. But the starting point is, you, you got to figure out where your income and capital gains positions are to start and, with before and, you can start planning for losses. A hundred percent. And this is why, like, and this is why I've been so vocal and I've been like screaming at people that, you know, and again, not to like shill Jacob's project, but like spending the point of getting Zen ledger software, be able to figure out where you are is the first need to go do that because you can't have these, you can't break it down. You can't do this analysis until you know where you stand and what, like what you need to take from there. Um, it's not have to, Oh, well I'll do this. And now I know exactly to start somewhere. 
Um, so I, I encourage all of you, at, at the very least, to check out what he's doing. If not, please start calculating what your taxes are going to be and understanding uh, kind of what decisions are going to be need, need to make in the coming months here, um, or actually in the coming weeks uh, here. So one thing I'll add on, I think we've touched on this with the NFT tax guide, but for people who are looking for kind of the best of both worlds, when you purchase the NFT tax guide, you actually get access to our 2021 executive plan, which is a $399 value, which gives you unlimited transactions within Zenledger. So if you're looking for the best of both worlds to get that knowledge and, and guidance through the tax guide and also want to, you know, be able to plug in your wallets and exchanges and get those figures in Zenlender, um, you know, it makes sense to be able to guide and, and, and get both. And we haven't even started talking about the next iteration, which is people buying virtual real estate or other th assets in the metaverse that are potentially going to have significant built-in losses at some point in time. And those aren't necessarily going to be on a wallet, but you know the, the whole application of all of what we've talked about to the metaverse and virtual assets is equally applicable. And it, it, we're going to see a lot more activity in 2022 in that space. Well, that sounds like another... Yeah, I think we... we base it itself, Jacob. Some... No joke, no joke. We got to get some L's going, though. We've got 30 minutes here. Yeah. Uh, I think I'd love to hear uh, NFTs Anonymous go first, Benjamin, Medved, and Shiny probably don't have losses, but... Uh, or, or, I'm, I'm surprised say, if Shiny even knows, Shiny, knows what the word loss means. Let's just even... say Shiny had losses, I think, on some, uh, some Gods Unchained cards that were resurfaced, and they IMX dropped him an entire kingdom, small, small island to make up for what could have been long, long losses. But instead, um, I, I, I will I tell you something like um, that, right? Oh, I actually am in question here. Uh, not to, not to derail, but it is tax related. Do it, related. fine. Do so, it. And then Tyler so, talk about losses. So IMX, uh, they did airdrop me something um, amazing for showing support to Gods Unchained very early on. Now, the thing about it, and the, the thing about a lot of these airdrops, things that uh, they might, grant them to you it's not accessible to you immediately they've allocated them to you maybe they've even set them aside for you um but you can't trade them yet for whatever reason um they won't let you take them out yet um or like not unlocked yet what have you what do you tax what number do you tax because the number is going up and down throughout this whole process do i take that? the second they allocated it that price the second i'm able to trade it where where do i go it depends. Um, and oh, shiny! If you want to, we can go into your specific case and discuss it in more details. If you're willing to discuss it with about a thousand people or so who are also listening in on it. Um, Wait a second! I thought it was just us, Alex. This is incredibly <laughs> awkward. It's I'm just, just a few people bathroom. with a philosophy. It's just philosophy <laughs> amongst friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, here? it can still be. I, I'm sure that this is something that can help other people. Uh, the uh, the amount of the airdrop aside, the details around it are still very valuable. We I can talk was, about it in one ten dollars. So that yeah, it, I was it, allocated something. Um, you know that that price was a dollar, and then by the time it was tradable, that price was five dollars. And so at that point, when it's tradable. Am I taxed on the tradable number or am I taxed on the initial number? The very first question is why was it restricted or how was it restricted in the sense of is the restriction because wallet did not support it or no wallet supported it or because they put in a, hey, we're allocating it to you, but in reality, you can get for six months. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a stake, but it was more like the latter than the former, which was they allocated it. It was actually in an account. IMX uses an L2, so it was in that L2 account, but you couldn't remove the liquidity from their system. So were you earning any sort of rewards or uh, I myself just am not 100 percent. I'm not um, I haven't played with this NFT myself, so I don't know. Uh, the specifics of it, so that's why I'm asking these questions. So, like, what were it's the a it's a fungible, yeah, it's a fungible token on these on these cards, right? or it's non fungible assets, but it's a fungible token that became available here, right? Um, and part of it, I think, like he's saying, so it was like a dollar right away, 
But Shiny, correct me on, on this one. Was it a token that had no value and then in a liquidity pool was established or did it have a value immediately? You just the couldn't token, get it. The token came to market with, with some value. Okay, okay. Couldn't touch it until it had already run up from a dollar to five dollars. Right, right. In, yeah. in, okay. Yes, because in this particular example, their system said there's too much traffic. We can't let everybody take out their allocation at this time. I had the allocation already. So if you, so this is a little tricky and you can have two people look at this and come up with two different reasons or two different answers on this. And I'll explain to you why it's pretty possible that one person will take the position that because it's already allocated to you, title has tra transferred and it's yours. Then in that case, whatever it's worth at the time of transfer or allocation to you, that that's your airdrop value. And that income is considered ordinary income. And then when you ultimately sold it for five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever it is, that that any appreciation would be considered capital gains. So that's one view. The other view that some people will have is that because you did not have the that to actually transact that token, that it's not actually yours. Whether it's a system limitation or some sort of physical or economic limitations on it, because that title doesn't go into your hands, that it's not income to you until you've actually had the ability to do something with it. Even if you didn't sell it, but you've at least had the opportunity or ability to sell it, then it's considered income to you. This is brilliant, Alex. So um, Alex has provided me with two choices, which means I get to choose one and say it's on behalf of you, right, Alex? Thank you so much for the tax advice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so it, it would need to be digged into that particular airdrop a little bit more detail um, to s figure out the exact specifics as to what's possible or isn't possible to claim. You know, I, I think... I, I think that the airdrops are a whole category onto themselves, you know, and I airdrop much, much talk about them. And this is only one, one thing, one problem. This is just from O'Shiny, but I'm sure there's so many instances of airdrops where number go down, number go up, number go sideways. Um, I can't hold the liquidity. I'm holding the liquidity. There's so much there that I actually have heard many people discuss. And of course, for this one example, I very much appreciate your time, Alex. Um, but I, I wonder if there's something to be done uh, where we can learn more about airdrops and uh, and the nuances. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we... Do, let, let me hop in for one second, Alex, to say, I, so we hosted this space not long ago, but it wasn't recorded. I think I think what we should do, and Herb, Herb and I have been I have, DMing I have the recording for that about this. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, and Herb and I have been DMing a little bit about just kind of how you know those of us that live on the tax guide are planning to kind of do things in the spring. Um, and I've got you know at this point I've now got, I've got another ten or fifty. Um, and I've got you know at this point I've now got another ten or fifty out saying they'd love to contribute, love to be a part of the conversation. So I think in the spring what we'll do is look at having um, you know. Uh, some herb and oh shiny and, and future proof and, and everybody that's kind of and, and NFT now like if we get a little flair and everybody's down to kind of just have this group plus a couple others maybe be kind of the core you know tax convo if, if it's something we want to kind of make consistent then we'll just do that you know um, and I think that's something we can work towards uh, you know we're, we've been a little consistent with Tuesdays and others the last three weeks but you know, obviously accountants and, and tax attorneys are going to be some of the hardest people in the world to reach in the spring. And it's going to be when all of us need them the most, right? They're just going to be grinding. They're not taking free consults or get to know you type conversations, right? They're just going to be working. So I think if we can get, you know, these guys committed to an hour here and there uh, every week, you know, something consistent and get some recordings going and, you know, figure out who we're working with and on what, I think that's, that's really great trajectory, you know, because this, this room could turn into right now. I just looked at my DMS. I've got like 30 message requests. You know, it would take us five hours just to answer all of these different questions down each rabbit hole. So yeah, we need the, the Tuesday, Tuesday tacos and taxes lunch right. hour tacos and, and taxes. every Tuesday it's a different topic and different I will tacos. get tacos that's from right. a new case. We'll all get that's tacos. That's right. 
That's right. I love it. Tyler, tell us about some L's. For sure. Now, I know myself and uh, DeFi defense lawyer, uh, Carlo, so we would be very interested in um, helping coordinate some of those opportunities as well. Sweet. Uh, he definitely wants to awareness. Uh, he's been doing so with the TikTok as well. And he's Man, he's a TikTok some- king. He really is. He's got more followers on TikTok, I think, than I have on Twitter. And he's been doing it a couple of weeks, he said. It's incredible. But all right. Uh, as I said, let's go down the rabbit hole. Let's have some fun here. I'm about to implicate myself. Um, <laughs> we're going to go down a story from DGen to business owner. Uh, I started with NBA Top Shot. I made probably dozens if not hundreds of transactions in about a month period some on the platform some through escrows um which for those that may not know is like a middleman and all of that was done on the flock chain technically then i found my way into ethereum based nfts fast forward uh got into fun and so i took uh two thousand dollars and was able to again through an escrow buy a zed run horse and with that, I turned that into 10 Ethereum, uh, which I turned that into 10 Ethereum, uh, which was my liquidity for starting my journey with NFTs. Uh, end up minting some board apes, end up at the next morning after the mint for one ETH, $2,700 at the time. A month and a half later, that becomes 50 Ethereum, which was about $130,000. Uh, into a crypto punk that I bought for 18 ETH, which was around uh, $40,000, and a V friend for 20 ETH, which was around $2,000, as well as you know numerous other things, which uh, many of which are now completely illiquid right now. Uh, so you know, there's that. Um, <laughs> fast forward a little bit more, I got involved with some marketing opportunities. So I was exchanging ETH as a form of compensation for helping different artists and projects uh, with their marketing, consulting behind the scenes, PR opportunities, etc. And then actually even found my way to a full time salaried position for a couple of months with a venture capitalist in New York City when I was uh, made co founder of Society of Players. Uh, that leads us to where we're at now, which is I'm the founder of Camp NFC. Uh, I am the owner of NFTs Anonymous LLC. And as part of that community, uh, we did some high profile giveaways on chain, including a CryptoPunk and a Bored Ape. So there is, uh, which by the way, were my assets personally that were transferred from my personal wallet to the wallet that was set up specifically for the business. I spoke with my CPA and he said that one, if I had not established as a business, which is not a shell, like it's very authentic. We have ongoing developing utility. We're giving value back to our community of like a thousand plus people so far. Um, And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And it's definitely something that's like a full-time job. It's my passion, whatever. Like it's definitely legitimate in nature. Um, but you know, it still does beg the question, which is why I of course got a CPA involved to ask, Hey, um, I had probably close to $2 million at one point in, uh, unrealized gains, some of which were realized and then had a loss of approximately, let's say around $800,000, Um, according to my CPA, due to the nature of how these, uh, assets were forfeited or distributed, it goes towards the marketing and the promotion of the business, which would be a, uh, like, which I believe a net loss. I I don't know the specifics, which is why I'm glad I'm here amongst, you know, this company of, uh, other professionals and, you know, the space, uh, of accounting uh, and, uh, definitely appreciate everyone that, can provide some guidance here and maybe some feedback on what has uh, been really a just in- extraordinary experience that I never in my life would have imagined I'd be in this situation in the first place. But um, I, you know, I'm just I'm very thankful for what this uh, community has offered me, um, and you know the opportunities associated with that. So yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. I just want to check one thing. Are those actual losses or is that just business expenses that you incurred? Well, see that I guess it's subject now, isn't it? Because one could argue that it is marketing promotion. 
another way of looking at it, you know, the IRS might say that that's just straight tax harvesting in a potentially illegitimate fashion. Well, the reason I want to wanted to ask this question is if it's an expense and you're giving somebody else something worth more than $600, uh, you need to issue them what's called a 1099 miscellaneous or 1099 NEC at the end of the year. Um, and you need to collect their W-9 information uh, in order to report that to the IRS. If you don't, you, the individual who issued basically or gave them money or value uh, might be subject to penalties and interest uh, properly reporting it to the IRS. Right. And I did see that form came out and that those expectations were set. Um, I guess my, my challenge would be how can that be expected in, you know, in this space where there is so much anonymous activity going on. And, you know, clearly I have my, picture up there (laughs) i'm not anonymous i'm very much out there and at times i i'll I'll even say that i might regret it because of um the vulnerable position that it has left me in uh comparatively to other people do operate completely anonymously and may not have the same level of accountability for their actions and and unfortunately so Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead, Charles. Oh, I was just going to say, un- oh, unfortunately, gonna... yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, Alex. Go. All right. Uh, so, from a from a tax side of things, um, before you transmit the the ape or whatever the way, if you tell the individual, hey, the only way we can actually transmit this because it's worth more than the time that we collect a W nine from you, ninety five percent of All right, no, no, deep, not frog. you, Alex. We got to switch to Charles. We can't. All right, you. Charles, this is your time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh no, he is he back? Okay, so I'll okay, I'll, I'll follow up with what Alex was saying, which is you 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 have before you give it to anybody, you need to say I need to give it W nine or W eight from you that says you're U.S. or you're foreign, and it has to be completed. Otherwise, I can't give it to you. Um, it is. The, there are penalties and interest for not filing 1099s, and there's also potentially a loss of deduction. So not only do you get whomped with penalties and interest, but then you potentially don't get to deduct what you didn't get 1099s for. And in this, you're exactly right. In this space, lots of people are anonymous. You have no idea who's on the other side. And the IRS's view is that's your problem, not their problem. They are, they're not going to be sympathetic. It's it's sad, it's unfortunate, but you know, Alex and Andrew, uh, do you have a different view on their sympathy? Not at all. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add that I appreciate exactly where you're coming from, and I think that's why I share my story is because there are a lot of people in this space that are uneducated or unaware of the repercussions of some of their actions. You know, they they're. They're thinking short-sighted. They're thinking of the quick flip, the short-term gains, and not necessarily considering, um, you know, what the consequences can be, uh, especially when having hundreds, if not thousands, of transactions that are undocumented. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll admit that even myself, I struggle how I'm going to address that, even when I have a CPA involved. It's definitely intimidating. Uh, So I can only imagine how others... Uh, you know, that we, right, we have people in this ecosystem that are as, as young as like 16 years old that are acting daily. So it, it's really interesting to just see how um, this is going to kind of play out and how we're going to regulate and uh, address things uh, in the future. Yeah, the, the parents of the 16 year olds are going to be very sick when the IRS shows up on their doorstep saying, oh, by the way, the income that your six old by old son or daughter generated, the hundred and fifty thousand bucks, why wasn't it on your tax return? And mom and dad are gonna go, Huh? I had no idea they were even doing this. Yeah, that's we, a pretty we real a, thing. We, and then we the have a couple of individuals who are underage 
uh, by underage, I mean under 18, uh, who are making three to four times what their parents are. And in order to engage with us for NFT and crypto work, we need to have their parents actually sign the engagement letters um, because they're underage. Um, and we have seen and we've, we've been advising uh, a lot of those families um, as to what they need to report, who needs to report the child as a dependent, um, and so on and so forth. Yo, Alex, how, how many of those parents didn't know that their children were money than them until you found out, until you spoke to them? Um, out of the 35 families that we have in that, I think only one or two of them actually did. And that's because um, the parents actually worked with, on the NFTs and got them into it. That, that must be incredibly shocking for a parent to find out about their like 13 year old kid. Yeah. We had one yeah. conversation where the kid did not want to tell his parents how much he made. Um, and we actually ended up getting a lawyer involved um, because it was more to do with, it was outside of taxes. We were like, all right, this has more to do with family dynamics. Let's get a lawyer involved and we'll take care of the taxes afterwards but figure out the family dynamics, who get, knows what, and then we'll, we'll come in over the top and take care of the tax and the words. And that's exactly why I'm so happy that you guys are here sharing these experiences because I think that, again, this is going super underreported and that it's underappreciated how serious of uh, you know, consequences people are going to face and that I don't think a lot of people are prepared for it. And again, just to my one other question, what about income when uh, either paying employees in cryptocurrency or when you are receiving compensation cryptocurrency from, say, marketing opportunities? I can uh, jump in and take that. Um, Go for it. So if you if we'll start with if you're receiving uh, cryptocurrency or even for that matter, you receive an NFT as compensation for services or you work for a uh, a project that's paying you in their native tokens or even their NFTs. It is income to the recipient at the fair market value of the tokens at, or the NFT at the time that it's received. And so for some projects that are very early on, there may not be a, uh, an actual traded value or a market value, but you still need to identify then the value of the services that you're providing and then record that as income. And so the long and short of it is that if you receive tokens, NFTs, any crypto as a payment, that is income to you at the fair market value. Not when you sell it, not when you exchange it, not at the end of the year, but at the time that you actually receive it. And so for a business, if they're paying employees or contractors in crypto, it's an expense. Um, it's an expense also at the fair market value at the time that it was paid. But also for the business, they're going to have a gain on the disposition of that crypto or that NFT. So in the uh, perspective of the business, there's two different entries from an accounting standpoint. There's the expense at fair market value, but then also a gain or loss, depending on the cost basis of the crypto when they first received it. I'm going to make it one level more complicated. What about if it's a business that has a community wallet and they're distributing residuals or uh, dividends back to the holders of, you know, said uh, token. Yeah. So um, from the perspective of the community or the DAO, that's where things get really tough. And I won't even get into that. We could spend two hours talking about DAO taxation. But if you're the holder of a, a token and you get a reward because you're part of the community, that too is income to you. And we're seeing that happen a lot in the NFT space, where because you hold an NFT, you get a drop of uh, a certain other token or another NFT. If that happens, that also is income to you as the recipient. It doesn't matter if it came from a DAO or a community wallet. It doesn't matter if it dropped from the sky or appeared on your doorstep. It doesn't matter where it came from. It's still income to you. Yeah, the, the whole issue of how do you treat Tokens going in and out of a multi-sig wallet, whether it's three people getting together, whether it's a DAO multi-sig, I think is a is a wonderful topic for another discussion because there's 
a, a myriad of issues in in there that uh, are are beyond what we can talk about. But it's it's definitely um, you know the the iron on neck method. They're going to grab whosoever neck they can get to first and easiest, and they'll say that's yours, and leave it to you to try and cut. It's not. So just because there's multiple signatories on a wallet doesn't mean that the IRS won't necessarily say, we found you first, it's all yours, prove to us that it's not. 100%. 100%. Hey, what's up, Ford? How are you? Uh, we're just talking about hey. elves. Curious yeah, if you thank- have any, uh, any big losses you've taken in the NFT space. Yeah, and it's, it's related to a question, and thank you guys so much for having this conversation. Um, first, a general comment about the uh, anonymous account thing. Definitely don't uh, recommend treating that as a way to evade taxes. Um, in fact, I would say you're actually a much bigger target by operating this way, um, and it likely is not going to be <laughs> something that proves useful for you. And there's a 20-year uh, statute of limitations on collecting taxes, I think, in America, so be very careful with that. Um, but the biggest L I think is kind of like a comprehensive L for me, which is I spent a lot of time this year working with artists, um, kind of collaborating on different work. So like I would concept an idea, work with a visual artist, sell it on my account. Um, and then we would split the profits 50, 50. And generally, you know, I would just transfer the money there, the the half of of the sort of proceeds to the artist that I worked with. So my fear now is that at the end of the year, I'm going to show all this, income that basically went into my wall um, and that I paid folks 50% of the proceeds. So it's going to look like I made a lot more money than I actually did. Um, and kind of connected to that, I haven't issued any 1099s, um, particularly because I've been working with people who are not always in the United States. So based on the earlier conversation, am I correct in understanding that um, if you don't issue a 1099, that basically you will not be able to claim that payment as a business expense? Not a hundred percent in the sense of you might still be able to take that expense, um, but uh, you need to be able to substantiate who it went to. And also the IRS could ultimately, at the end of the day, disallow the deduction because it wasn't reported to the IRS as to who actually. And how long do you have to, to make those kind of reports? Uh, the uh, 1099 reporting is required January 31st of next year for Got the, it. for 21, for the 21 tax year, it's due January 31st of 2022. Great. Yeah. Super helpful. And, and when you guys have future conversations about taxes in general, I hope you also cover tax uh, loss uh, or sort of uh, tax shelter opportunities. There's not many out there, but there are some that I've started to investigate. Um, if you guys have any information to share there, it would be super helpful for those of us who do plan on paying taxes, but get the uh, volume of them. Yeah. I received um, one other question in my DM. I think oh. it was important to go over in regards to what if someone gets scammed and they lose an incredible amount of ETH or they have uh, NFTs that are siphoned out of their wallet. Um, maybe they even do so knowingly through, they do go through an escrow or something along those lines and they make a human error as opposed to it being, uh, something like where something is, uh, you know, a, a more of an attack or something's being forced upon them, uh, mm-hmm. where it's more of a voluntary action. So I, I know there's probably some differences there, uh, that I'd be curious to see if you guys have any information on. Yeah. Um, my, my thoughts would be if, if, if you were hacked, your wallet was hacked, your Gemini account or whatever was hacked, your account was hacked and it taken a theft loss. Um, If you're like one of my clients who mistakenly sent a very large, a very large number wallet and can't get it back. uh, It's unclear that that would actually qualify as a theft loss because that was just a mistake on your part. You you you're out the money, but that doesn't necessarily make it a deductible loss. But be interested to hear Alex or Andrew's thought. But be interested to hear Alex or Andrew's thoughts on. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. So yeah, with we we've looked at it. We've had a couple of clients who fat fingered payments. Um, to contractors and contractors are like, Hey, thanks. I'm really sorry, but um, I'm not sending you the money. And they're 
anonymous. So like they literally have changed their IDs, uh, Twitter handles and whatnot ever since. Um, for those transactions, we'll attempt to take them as a business expense because they're contractor payments that were paid over uh, and is a an potential issue because there are no W-9s or W-8s in order to issue uh, the 10 any Yeah, and, and Board, you, your question Sorry. about a payment to... Sorry, uh, board. You, you had a question about a payment to someone outside of the U.S. There, there is a different form. It's not a 1099. It's a 1042. But in order to do that, they give you a form that says, "I'm not U.S. I'm foreign." And if they do that, that's not income to you. There's no withholding. There's no tax issues. But if you don't get the form that says, "I'm foreign," the IRS will assume they're U.S and then wonder why you didn't give them a 1099. Yeah, I think, and you know, as we're, we're hitting the, the end of the rope here, we've been going for an hour and a half. We've got, uh, you know, a bunch of questions going on, a um, bunch of questions in the DMs. I think this could go forever, but like I mentioned before, you know, between Hunter and Future Proof, O'Shiny and Herb, uh, with the O'Shiny show and everything they're building out, Matt Medved with NFT Now, you know, we've got a few different kind of media arms here, you know, Farouk and, and Rug Radio, if we get those guys looped in. In an ideal world, you know, I, I would like to say that the five or 10 other CPAs that I'm getting messages from that you're telling me, you know, hey, I work with taxes as well, or I'm in Canada, or I'm over here, you know, I'd love to to find a way to kind of continue to make these people known and available. And, and you know, just as a reminder for anyone in the space, right, like, this isn't me saying that Andrew and Alex and Charles are the greatest or the only tax attorneys and accountants in the world that work with crypto, but they're who I found that were also in the weeds at the time, working hard on the stuff. They've got great backgrounds and experience. We believe is very good. You know, the NFT tax guide is, is tagged at the top. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's been $15 billion in transactions in the NFT world this year. So you're going to need more than three accountants and attorneys anyways. Right. Uh, so again, you know, definitely not holding ourselves out as the best or the only, but, you know, incredibly competent. We feel good about the crew here. I'm not a tax attorney. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more of an executive producer that thought this was an important topic and brought a group together. So uh, I hope you learned something today and, and, you know, feel free to continue reaching out to any of us uh, independently or collectively. And, you know, Zen Ledger with, with their software, whether you get it through our purchase or you go direct, you know, they're a competent software that's going to be helpful in this process. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's kind of it from us, Hunter, if you want to wrap it up, yeah. go for it. Yeah. I mean, like one, if you, if you're in this space right now and you've been intrigued by the discussion, I implore that you go follow Jacobs and Ledger, Dan, um, you know, Charles and Gord, like everybody who's up here speaking, They're, these are all very smart people. Um, and, and you know whatever they're putting out is worth following as well. Um, but as well, you know we're we're gonna have more of these talks, so be on the lookout for that. But also, uh, start your taxes. I, I think that's kind of like the the ultimate thing here is make sure you are aware that it's 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 there, um, and it's very important. So uh, yeah, thank you for coming out today. Thank you for listening. All the questions and the DMs that we've all gotten, uh, it makes me feel really really able to provide some value. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Good stuff. Bye, everybody. Awesome. All right, everybody. Have a good one, GM, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.